Hi, everybody. So nice to see so many people here. Great. So today, I'd like to tell you a story about a mother named Martha and her malnourished child. This was her youngest child, and she had three other children at home. And she arrived to us just before the rainy season was about to start. This is actually when we see the highest number of malnourished children, because last year's harvest has ended before the next is even planted. Martha's child was severely malnourished, and we explained to her that she would need to stay in the hospital for at least two weeks. This made Martha extremely anxious. With her husband away with the army, there was no one else to look after her other three children or cultivate her land. Despite the help me and my team offered, Martha was left with a horrendous decision. She could stay and possibly save the life of her youngest child. But if she missed the chance to cultivate her land, this would mean putting all her children's lives and her own at risk. Or she could leave, knowing that her youngest child would most likely die, but that she would have the opportunity to cultivate her land and that she wouldn't put her other three children's lives or her own at risk. There are no social services in South Sudan, and Médecins Sans Frontières is a medical organisation. And what Martha and her family were suffering from was chronic food instability. And despite the efforts of me and my team, by the time we even got in touch with someone who could possibly do something, it was too late. Martha had left. And these are the stories you face every day on the front line that no training and no experience can prepare you for. So what is the role of a humanitarian nurse? As nurses, <coughs> we make up 80% of all healthcare workers in developing countries. We are the front line. We are the first person a patient will see, whether it's in their community or a healthcare facility. We are the largest and costliest group of healthcare professionals. We are the largest group of expats that Médecins Sans Frontières sends to the field. And we are considered the largest untapped source for improving quality care. Now, does anybody else get nervous when they hear those two words? Quality care. Ooh. Now, I know that it's those two words that have kept me awake at night, both during and after my missions. So to keep it simple, I define it using three terms. Safe care, effective care, meaning evidence and research based, and patient and family centeredness. So let's tackle safety first. Every year, 42 million adverse medical events occur in developing countries, including cannula related blood infections and catheter related urine tract infections. Combined, they fall within the top 20 causes of death and disability globally. And 21 million, 50% are preventable. So now I'm definitely awake at night and my eyes are wide open. And then in both South Sudan and Haiti, my nurses called me to tell me that patients were dead. I remember the first time they called me, I thought, hang on a minute. I thought the whole point in being a nurse was to be called before the patient died. You know, when the patient was deteriorating, to work with the team and to possibly prevent that death. And so now I'm awake, my eyes are wide open and alarm bells are ringing. And I know that changes need to be made. So the nursing team and I start to make them. I order drugs trolleys so that they can <laughs> administer drugs at the bedside. We organize a new ordering system so we have all the medication we need on the ward. I order clocks so that we can take vital signs. <laughs> we put in an early warning score system so that nurses know what action needs to be taken when. We also assign specific nurses on specific shifts to take vital signs. They ask for refresher training and NG tubes and how to check their position. And I order resources and guidelines so that if nurses are ever unsure, they can look up what they need to be doing. 
And while I was doing this, I realised you can have the best doctors, you can have the best medical supply system, you can have the best guidelines, but if you don't have the best nurses, if they cannot notice a patient that's deteriorating, if they are not able to provide medication safely, and that doesn't matter whether it's because of the facilities available or their training, your patients are still going to die. So what is out there? What research and evidence is out there for us to provide effective care and ensure that we have those best nurses? Well, unfortunately, very little. Humanitarian nursing is its own speciality, and therefore it needs its own evidence and research base. For example, when I did my masters, I looked at how nursing is crucial to quality care in humanitarian settings. And one of the key findings was the role of the caretaker, a family member or a friend who stayed with the patient throughout their time in hospital. And actually, they were providing a large amount of what is normally considered nursing care. They were washing, dressing, toileting, mobilizing, feeding patients, and therefore having a massive impact on the quality of nursing care patients were receiving. But there is little, if any, research showing the effect that this has had on the role of a nurse in humanitarian settings, or the relationship between a patient, a caretaker, and a nurse. And even the research that does exist for humanitarian nurses, it so rarely reaches the front line where it's needed most, because those dissemination channels just aren't in place. So that leaves us with patient and family-centeredness. Well, that's about ensuring that mothers' needs, like Martha, are met. Understanding patients' and caretakers' needs in humanitarian settings is so important, and the role that nurses can play in making sure they're met. Nursing is complex, and it involves so many different dimensions yet it has such huge potential. Yet despite that potential, humanitarian nursing is not prioritized. For example, Médecins Sans Frontières only had nursing advisors in all five headquarters in 2016. And the World Health Organization only appointed their first chief nursing officer last year. Yeah? We are making progress, <laughs> but very slowly. So what's the solution? Well, for me, part of the solution started right here with the DTN. It taught me how to be a humanitarian nurse. It taught me to see the bigger picture and look past the patient that was in front of me, but to the community they were coming from and how I could prevent them from having to come to the hospital in the first place. It taught me to aim high and not be completely satisfied with assisting some nurses in South Sudan and Haiti, with providing them with what they need to provide quality care. I want to provide all humanitarian nurses worldwide with what they need to provide quality care. Therefore, I'm here today to ask all of you to take a bigger interest in policy making and healthcare management. As nurses, we make up 80% of healthcare professionals, but that 80% is on the front line. When you start to move up the ladder to healthcare professionals and management and policy makers, our numbers dwindle, and that's where the changes are being made. We are the largest untapped potential for improving quality care. And therefore, we can lead the way. We can push for humanitarian nursing to be prioritized, to ensure that all healthcare managers and policy makers are providing humanitarian nurses with what they need to provide safe, effective, and patient-centered care. Humanitarian nursing goes beyond the borders of any other nursing. And it's time that healthcare management and policy reflected that. Thank you.